Hello, everyone. This is uh, episode four of our series on the Con Constantine and the rise of Paul, or the marriage to Paul, however we want to call it. Uh, this one we're going to be going to present Simca on the History Channel did an expose proving the fraud of Constantine, and he did it in a way that no Christian textbook can any longer be written since this this was released. But they still are out there. The, the lie is in every Christian history book you read that Constantine was a true Christian. But wait till you see. It's going to end in a conclusive way. So there's the, beyond any doubt, as we'll show you when we get to the very end. And I think what, what I would just want to remind you, in episode three, we proved that Mithras worship was of Sol Invictus. And this was on Constantine's coinage from 309 to 318 AD, and that would be six years after he, he'll he later claim, in 324, for the first time, he'll claim he had seen a, uh, a symbol in the sky that he would conquer his foe, and he had a vi later, he'll also claim he had a vision of Jesus in uh, in his brain, or, or somewhere, in some way, but I think it was a vision in his dreams. Okay, so here we're going to go. Okay, so now we're going to see a slide, a very important one to realize the fraud of, of uh, Constantine is very provable from undisputable facts. So he's going to claim that he had an experience with Christ in 312 AD, and that's at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. Do you see this? That's the key. He's That's when he says later, he'll say in 324 AD, this story is true okay however from 309 AD to 318 AD he is creating coins with called uh, with the god Sol Invictus now you see to the right over here we have the uh, the coins and so from 318 309 to 318 AD he is um, putting himself his face is on one side of the coin and on the other side of the coin is an image of Sol Invictus so he is totally depicting himself as a friend of Sol Invictus on the coinage. So the Arch of Constantine is a documentary proof of the fraud in, that we're talking about because the the Arch of Constantine is to commemorate the victory of the Battle of Milvian Bridge, which is actually depicted on the Arch itself. And so when you look at the Arch in this video, you're gonna see their pagan gods and you're gonna also see which pagan gods they are. So then care, keep in mind this while you're watching this, it's only in 324 AD that Constantine makes a very belated claim that in 312 AD on the eve of the battle of, of the Milvian Bridge, he had a divine vision of Jesus and a sign, a, a C and an R, the Chi in the Row that's called, symbol, which told Constantine, in this symbol you will conquer. And so he understood that meant he would be victorious. So he put this symbol allegedly on his men's shields, which is very dubious, but we'll give it, we'll assume that's true. Okay, so enjoy this video and hopefully it will uh, illuminate uh, these facts and you'll see the the fraud is self-evident just from these facts alone. But there's a, there's a conclusive co proof going to come at the very end of the video's series that we'll be looking at. Early Christian history states that the Roman Emperor Constantine received a divine vision of Jesus before defeating his arch-rival Maxentius, winning control of the Roman Empire and causing the Western world to become Christian. But was Constantine a true Christian? The most important statement we have from him is his triumphal arch in Rome. On it, Simca doesn't find a single Christian icon, but he does find pagan symbols. On this panel, Constantine is surrounded by pagan gods, the god of the river Tiber, a winged goddess of victory, and by Roma, goddess of Rome, an archaeological patchwork of pagan symbolism. To gain control over the entire Roman Empire, Constantine needed the support of the officer corps and the Roman elite. Many members of these classes belonged to a mysterious cult that had been around since before Jesus. The cult was called Mithraism, named after a Mediterranean sun god called Mithras. How did Constantine mobilize both these religions to serve his own ends? 
Can it be that what appealed to him was a blend of Mithraism and Christianity? Did he fuse the two together to create a super religion that would allow him to gain control over the entire Roman world? Okay, next in this slide, we're going to see that uh, we're going to digress in a sense. We're going to look at Mithras worship that Constantine would have been exposed to uh, among his troops, his officer corps. And we're going to see that there was something very similar he could co-opt. He could see by experience if he had attended a Mithras worship service, which obviously he did because they worshipped Saul Invictus. Mithras was another version of Saul Invictus and it was called Saul Invictus Mithras and that article I showed you previously. So he could co-opt it very easily into Christianity and make Christianity really the Mithras religion. So they believed in salvation by eternal blood. I just want to underscore that, see that? So that you'll see that in this video coming up. It's written on the wall in this Mithras chamber. They believed in the resurrection of the dead. We'll see that. The cult was itself run by priests, as Catholicism later would do. And December 25th was also the birthday of Mithras, as it was Saul Invictus, which is probably why Saul Invictus Mithras would be having the same birthday. Okay, so take a look at this. It's just going to be a, 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 key, a look at a Mithras, uh, basically, temple. It's called a Mithraeum, but it looks just like a little church, if you just take a look at it. So you can see where our churches come from. And you can kind of see there's... The, the men sit around the the uh, the perimeter of this building, and you'll see also how the what the worship of uh, the how the front of the area looked like a worship area, not too different from how later Roman Catholic churches would look. Not far from the Roman military fort, where Simca has seen evidence of Christian soldiers in Constantine's army. Another fort was discovered in 1949 by a French bulldog sniffing for bones. But instead of bones or Christian symbols, this fort revealed a special temple built by Roman officers that were devoted to the pagan god, Mithras. My father's dog, same breed as this one, a French bulldog, was sniffing around and found the middle altar. As you can see, it's very wet here. It was all preserved due to the dampness. Now, this is close to the Roman fort? Yes, and it was 500 foot soldiers, and Mithras was for the officers. So that's why it's so small. So the Roman officer class, which Constantine belonged to, secretly worshipped Mithras at this temple. At the exact same time, an increasing number of ordinary Roman soldiers were worshipping Jesus right next door. Mithraism was an elitist and secret religion, practiced only by men. Initiates walked into this clandestine temple, lit only by a few torches. Arriving at the front of the temple, these initiates would have seen an altar to the god Mithras, rays projecting from his head. Lit from behind by candlelight, the halo effect symbolized Mithras' status as a sun god, a striking precursor to the halo that surrounds the head of Jesus. This could be mere coincidence if it weren't for the fact that archaeologists have found the remains of Mithraic temples all over the Roman Empire. And more often than not, those temples were found hidden beneath the world's first Christian churches. To see one of these Mithraeums, Simca now goes to the Santa Prisca Church in Rome. Here, excavators pulled up the floor of the church and discovered one of the largest Mithraic temples ever found. In cavernous, dark rooms like these, the Roman elite would worship in secret. This is amazing. I feel like I'm in the Notre Dame Cathedral <laughs> of Mithraism. Well, this is a pretty sizable one. The idea is, is this is a recreation of the primal cave where Mithras commits the sacrifice of the bull, which is the core event in Mithraism. The one source of light in this dark temple illuminates the centerpiece, a bas-relief that depicts the main myth of Mithraic belief. 
Jutting out from the primordial rock, the sun god Mithras, the son of the sun, slaughters the sacrificial bull. And through the shedding of his blood, the universe is created anew. Essentially what we're seeing is Mithras being seen as the key creator god who makes possible the regeneration of life. And you've got the primordial rock, you know, the cocoon out of which the whole universe is born. Impressive, but it also sounds pretty pagan. And yet, a strange inscription here suggests a more Christian approach. We don't have many inscriptions of Mithras. Right. It's a secret, and they didn't write that much. This is unusual, this place, that it does have a very faded inscription. That now. is correct. One particular text, the Latin, translates as, and you have saved us through the shedding of the eternal blood. You have saved us through the shedding of the eternal blood. Yes. So here, the central bloodletting yes. is seen as an act of salvation. Yes, and the, the key event in the whole nature of cosmic creation and the whole nature of life. Mithras sacrifices the bull and spills its blood, strangely corresponding to the Christian concept of Jesus offering his own blood to save mankind. But the similarities don't end there. A lot of the Mithraic rituals very closely corresponded to what the Christians would do in their worship. The sacred meal that they would participate in is taking the body or the blood of the sacrifice by sharing a meal of bread and wine. Here? Here. So it's communion. It's a basically a communion, a Eucharist. And those who partake in this feast will live forever. So just as Christians reenact the Last Supper with Jesus before his death, a form of communion was also practiced here. And just as Jesus died and was resurrected, so was Mithras. Which is why at this altar, Mithras is pictured right next to a sculpture of an Egyptian god. And this particular god, if you look carefully at his forehead, you notice that little lock that hangs yeah. down there? That's actually what signify that he is the reconfiguration of the god Osiris. And Osiris is the dying exactly. and resurrected right. god of the Egyptians. Right. Just like Christians, Mithraeus believed in the concept of resurrection, which may explain why both religions were popular to members of the Roman military. Faced with the daily risk of death, who wouldn't put their faith in the possibility of resurrection and eternal life? But what's most compelling is evidence that Mithras's followers celebrated his holy birth on December 25th, the same day that Christians would later celebrate the birth of Jesus. It was shocking to me when I learned that nobody talked about Jesus' birthday as December 25th when, right. when Jesus <laughs> was walking the earth. Yes. It was Mithras' birthday. That is correct. And this is because December 25th was for the Romans always a traditional important holiday, the feast of the Saturnalia, which went on for 12 days. <laughs> and everybody was expected to give presents during oh that goodness. time period. And so, so suddenly 12 days, gift giving, December 25th. And a lot of these symbols do find their way into Christian iconography. As it turns out, Mithraism is embedded in the Gospels themselves through the story of the three wise men. At the Church of St. Apollinaire Nuovo in Ravenna, Italy, the iconography is still Mithraic. Here we have the three wise men, also known as the Magi. This is the scene as recounted at the birth of Christ, that these three wise men are bringing these gifts to the Christ child. And the hats that they're wearing, in Greco-Roman art, this sort of became the standard hat that would be used in their artwork to denote somebody who's an Easterner. But these hats weren't worn by just any non-Christian from the East. Called Phrygian caps, they were the official hats of the Mithraic priesthood, also known as the Magi. Even Mithras is depicted wearing the same style of hat. And although there are no Christian symbols on the Arch of Constantine, the arch is literally ringed by eight Magi-looking figures wearing the Phrygian hats of the Mithraic priesthood. 
But if Constantine was the worshiper of a sun god, how could he have championed Christianity? Unless he created a new version of Christianity, partially fashioned in the image of Mithraism. To do that, he would have had to convince Christians that he was one of them, while in reality supporting the introduction of pagan ideas into their faith. And to do that, I believe Constantine needed the help of someone, someone working on the inside of the early Christian church. Okay, so uh, Simka is asking the question, who is the man on the inside who's going to help uh, basically Constantine to pull off this fraud? And he's going to say it's Eusebius. And, and uh, there's no doubt that what Eusebius does does help him. But I also say that part of the answer is his help is coming from Paul because ultimately he knows how he's going to do this. He, he, the key is he has to have the worship of his God, Saul Invictus, be acceptable which is not on Shabbat, it's on Saturday, Sunday. Anyway, so, um, but the uh, key fact we'll learn here is that Eusebius is willing to go back and do the history of the Milvian Bridge over again to reflect what Constantine's claiming. How many years later? The Milvian Bridge history is old history, 12 years earlier. In 324, it's 312 uh, AD was when this uh, battle took place. 12 years later, he's gonna be willing to change the way it was accounted. So let's watch this video. But before we do, there's one more fact I just want to bring out that the Emperor Aurelian had brought in the worship of the god Sol Invictus, or who was known uh, by, as the name Sol Invictus by the 324 period. And that uh, god, god Sol Invictus, was worshipped every December 25th by celebrations that would kick off uh, a long period, 12 days of uh, Saturn Saturnalia celebration and gift giving and all that kind of stuff. So just so we know some, where some of our traditions are really coming from, it just, just kind of accentuates the problem. And although there are no Christian symbols on the Arch of Constantine, the arch is literally ringed by eight magi looking figures wearing the Phrygian hats of the Mithraic priesthood. But if Constantine was the worshiper of a sun god, how could he have championed Christianity? Unless he created a new version of Christianity, partially fashioned in the image of Mithraism. To do that, he would have had to convince Christians that he was one of them, while in reality supporting the introduction of pagan ideas into their faith. And to do that, I believe Constantine needed the help of someone, someone working on the inside of the early Christian church. Constantine is known to history as the emperor who converted the Roman Empire to the teachings of Jesus. But the Arch of Constantine has no Christian symbolism on it whatsoever. And evidence found beneath the first Christian churches suggests that Constantine fused Mithraism with Christianity to win the patronage of the powerful Roman elite. But this leaves one problem. How could Constantine get true Christians to go along with his version of their faith? And what about the founding fathers of the church? After years of persecution, of worshiping in secret, surely they wouldn't let Constantine manipulate their religion for his gain. Or would they? There's compelling evidence to suggest that Constantine's vision was a postscript to what really happened at the Milvian Bridge. As it turns out, while Constantine was still alive, there was only one church father who recorded Constantine's life and his celebrated conversion to Christianity. His name was Eusebius, and besides becoming Constantine's sole biographer, he also became Constantine's right-hand man in the Christian world. According to Eusebius's writings, it's here at the Milvian Bridge, north of Rome, that Constantine had a vision of the cross and a dream about Jesus that inspired him to win the battle and change the world forever. So here's the Milvian Bridge. This is the bridge that gets associated with the battle. So this bridge behind you becomes, in a sense, a metaphor for the change of human history. Yes. The bridge becomes a way to refer to, not necessarily the battle itself, but the consequences of the battle. Yet in Eusebius' first draft of this account, 
he doesn't mention Constantine's vision at all. No vision, no dream yet. So Eusebius' first account of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge that took place somewhere right where we're standing, even Eusebius, who's like yes, a church father, bishop, great yes. admirer of Constantine, does not mention visions. In that account, no. Without a vision of Jesus, how did Constantine convince his contemporaries that he had converted to Christianity? Eusebius' own writings suggest that Constantine persuaded Eusebius to rewrite his account of the Milvian Bridge during a great banquet that Constantine held for the leaders of the Christian Church in the year 325. After years of persecution, Eusebius and his fellow bishops were now being hosted by the emperor himself. And it seems that it was at this banquet, 13 years after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, that Eusebius first heard anything about Constantine's vision. So Constantine tells the story about the vision of the cross before the battle at the Milvian Bridge. When Constantine tells the story, he emphasizes, first of all, the vision of a cross in the sky at noontime. Secondly, he then had a dream in which Jesus Christ himself appeared and explained the vision to him. Almost he, like a, he's a prophet. He has visions, he has dreams. Jesus speaks to him. Precisely. And here, in these original texts by Eusebius, one can see the impact of Constantine's story on Eusebius and his fellow bishops. So here's Eusebius's description of the banquet. He compares this banquet with the emperor to the coming of Jesus. And Christians had anticipated if there was going to be a Christian ruler, it might well be Jesus come back to earth. And now suddenly it turns out to be the emperor himself. Now portrayed as a Christ-like figure, Constantine turned his so-called vision into the official history. And that history was soon propagated by Christian art. Here we have Raphael. Yes. Now Raphael, when he paints, he paints a vision in the sky. It's a cross. By this right. sign, you will conquer, and so on. This is mythology becoming history. Yes. Even without knowing the narrative, you just want to stare at these frescoes. So this is sort of a last attempt to reaffirm this papal narrative, which had already been shown to be a fiction. A myth based not on history, but on a fiction. But if Eusebius's biography of Constantine represents the myth, what did Constantine really believe in? The only direct link we have to Constantine is his arch, which is adorned by pagan symbols. But on it, we can also see reliefs depicting three former emperors. The philosopher Marcus Aurelius, the conqueror Trajan, and the statesman, Hadrian. All stolen from previous monuments and strategically recycled for his arch. Begging the question, why would Constantine decorate a monument to his own achievements with reliefs taken from other emperors? Unless he was really saying something about himself. Isn't he telling us what everybody thinks are winners are really losers? And me, I'm, I'm the real winner. At the end of the day, I'm going to refashion the world in a way that Hadrian Trajan and Marcus Aurelius could not even imagine. I would agree with you that Constantine would have been very happy if people looking at his arch had been able to take away the message that he is going to supersede the legacy of even Rome's best previous emperors. But how was he going to do that? The answer may lie at the very top of the arch. Here, there is an inscription, and it states in Latin, Instinctu Divinitatis, which describes Constantine as divinely inspired. But if it's not Jesus who's inspiring him, which God is? When looking at what's depicted on his arch, what we find are pagan gods from the Roman pantheon, and none so prominently rendered as the sun god Apollo. The light is amazing. 
And it's so appropriate with the rising of the sun god right there to have it illuminated by the sun this way. Before Constantine's alleged vision, he followed the official religion of the Roman Empire, the imperial cult, a pagan religion that worshipped Apollo above all else. Much like the pagan god Mithras, Apollo was the sun god that represented the light of creation. According to the imperial cult, Constantine, as emperor, was a superhuman avatar, the link between Apollo and the rest of humanity. And from the archaeology, it's clear that Constantine bought into this idea completely. He commissioned this 12-meter statue of himself. And not surprisingly, the statue came with an enormous head. Built into this statue's healthy hairline may be evidence that Constantine believed he was more than a mere representative of Apollo. There are dowel holes that certainly were for some kind of insert, and it seems likely that it was for a rayed crown. That's not Christian to me. To me, that's saying, I am God. Right. There's absolutely no humility uh, in any of Constantine's self-fashioning. I mean, he's very happy to have a 40-foot-tall statue of himself looming over this space in the center of Rome. He allows cities in the north of Italy to erect cults to his family to worship him as a god. He's aloof, he's yes. giant, and he's yes. godlike. Yes, he's superhuman. He is superhuman. The image of Constantine with sun rays emanating from his head not only matches the earliest images of Apollo, it also matches the iconography of Mithras. And is it just coincidence that Christian art begins to depict Jesus the same way, with a halo of light around his head? Or was Constantine combining all the gods of light into one? When Constantine claimed to have had a vision of the Melvian Bridge, which religion was Constantine truly embracing? Did Constantine abandon paganism for Christianity? Or did he blend Apollo and Mithras into Jesus Christ and then refashion all three in his own image? As it turns out, when Constantine had his arch built, he topped it off with a bronze portrait of himself. Destroyed in antiquity, this statue depicted him riding the same kind of chariot as Apollo, seemingly taking off into sunny skies. Constantine is known to history as the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity. Okay, so uh, he's, he's suggested that Eusebius is the uh, ultimate cul culprit. He did help a lot. Obviously, he believed that... Uh, that uh, Constantine was a fulfillment of Christ coming to help the church. And that was a real uh, mistake to assume somebody like Constantine could have been a, a symbol of Christ, a person who's serving Christ. And he didn't, he didn't realize it. But now we're going to see in this final video that uh, Constantine takes all the gloves off and he, you can see who he is for real. Okay. And then we'll come back with another episode in a different uh, area of Constantine that will be helpful. But, uh, uh, so enjoy this final uh, clip. Technology he left behind. His triumphal arch is covered with pagan symbols, and from the statues he erected of himself, it seems that Constantine not only worshipped pagan gods, he saw himself as having a special relationship with them. If Constantine saw himself as divinely ordained, he would have seen his reign. As a new founding, he would have believed that he was responsible for changing the course of human history. And the new founding needs a new capital. Rome would no longer do. So he went to what is today Istanbul in modern-day Turkey, and he founded a new capital for his new empire. He didn't name it after Jesus or the apostles. Rather, he stayed true to his nature and he named it after himself. He called the new city Constantinople. He left Rome, and he, he certainly never returned there again. Settled on this incomparable site. It bridges the two continents. It's strategically and tactically located in, in virtually an ideal position, easily defended. And I think he wanted a monument to himself. He wanted his own city with his own imprint on it. Despite Constantine's reputation as the first Christian emperor, 
the most dominant feature of Constantinople's skyline was not a Christian church, but a giant column that was once topped by a huge bronze statue of the sun god, Apollo. The statue is long gone, and the column is under renovation. But at the time of Constantine, people were worshiping the sun god here. When the city was built, this was a big plaza or forum, and that column was in the center of it. It's about 100 feet in the air. What's significant about it is that in subsequent years, Christian bishops and theologians were very upset about the fact that the people of Constantinople conducted divine services here. And yet, Constantine's statue of Apollo was not like other pagan images. He did make a slight modification to it. He replaced Apollo's face with his own. But what's even better is the tradition continues that in this statue, he put a relic of the true cross. So he's attaching relics of Jesus to or inserting them in this statue. So he erects a statue of himself. And this statue depicts him as Apollo. But for good measure, we've got a little bit of the true cross mixed in. Yes.